it's great to be in Seattle. I have family here and, and friends here, and, um, and I'm delighted to be here to talk about migraine because a lot has changed about how we manage migraine and headache disorders in the last um, just really year alone because of new treatments that have been available. So the focus will mostly be on some of these new treatments, but also other clinically applicable um, treatments that, that come up in practice all the time. So I don't have any financial conflicts of interest at all. And some of these treatments that I'll be discussing, some are investigational still that where FDA approval or clearance is expected within the year. So I'll, I'll make note of all of those too. So this is how I'm going to just organize the presentation. And also, I'm happy to be interrupted at any time if there's questions or save them for the end. Um, first, I'll just briefly review why we do need new treatments for headache disorders, especially migraine, because there's such a massive epidemiological burden. And um, the treatments that we have now, while some of them are pretty good, they generally fail many patients. So we definitely need more treatments. We'll talk about the new emerging medications. There's also new. Um, devices that have been cleared by the FDA and soon more to come. So we'll talk about those as well. So those are already available for prescription by, by all of us. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about procedures in headache because that's become an important part of clinical practice in headache. And then, um, and then we'll just summarize. So I think, you know, migraine in general is such a massive epidemiological problem. According to the World Health Organization, it's the second um, leading cause of years lost to disability amongst all people in the world. So it's a huge epidemiologic burden. Nearly 40 million people in the United States have migraine. And um, the most severe form of migraine, which is called chronic migraine, that has a 1% a or perhaps 2% population prevalence, which means that um, over 3 million people in the United States annually have chronic migraine. So the most severe form of migraine, which is chronic migraine, is just as prevalent to say all of epilepsy combined of, of, regardless of severity. So that's just sort of a state of the epidemiolo epidemiology. And then chronic migraine, as many of you might know in clinical practice, it doesn't go away like migraine that's much more episodic does. People who have chronic migraine generally remain with chronic migraine for a long period of time. And then our treatments have a lot of limitations. You know, in the clinical trials and also in clinical practice, the treatments that we use, um, the therapeutic gain isn't really huge in many patients. Um, it's hard to know who to pick for which treatment. There's not really a great deal of personalized medicine. Often we use preventative treatments and we pick a treatment that might have certain side effects that might be more favorable to a certain patient rather than why a drug might work better for them. So that's also a limitation. Uh, many of them are hard to tolerate. For example, topiramate, which is probably the most, has been the most common, commonly prescribed migraine preventative medicine, has a lot of side effects and people don't generally like it. Um, and um, often the preventative treatments take time to work and people don't stick with them. So in, in big pharmacoepidemiologic studies, um, most people are not on the prescription preventative treatment that you have prescribed um, at six months later. And of course, for acute treatments like triptans, um, there's lots of cardiovascular contraindications or if someone has cardiovascular risk factors, we often avoid them. So there's a big unmet need for acute treatments too. Um, this is just a big menu of the last guideline for acute treatment for migraine, and there's just a lot here, but I think what, oh wow, that's a nice spotlight. So what you can really notice is basically those that have the highest level of evidence are basically um, NSAIDs and, and these triptans, and, um, and basically acetaminophen, aspirin, caffeine, which is, you know, the brand name of that is Excedrin. So I think the, really we're limited for two big categories, NSAIDs and triptans for acute treatment for migraine for, in terms of what has good evidence. So we certainly need more treatments because many people can't take either of those categories. And for preventative treatments, um, what has, you know, what has starred is FDA approved. So basically we have um, forms of valproic acid, topiramate, and a couple of beta blockers. And then other things that have um, evidence, there's a nutraceutical called Butterbur, and, um, and things that we probably use all the time that we think have good evidence or have good efficacy in clinical practice, like tricyclic antidepressants, they don't have um, a great degree of evidence because they're old drugs and no one is studying them anymore. So, but certainly these are not designer drugs for migraine. These medicines are all drugs invented for hypertension, depression, epilepsy, and then have been borrowed to be used as migraine preventative treatment. So luckily, there's going to be lots of, in the next guideline that comes out in a couple of years, there's going to be lots of new um, things to add. So certainly botulinum toxin A, which also has really transformed headache practice because it was FDA approved for chronic migraine, will be on the list, and lots of other drugs and devices that I'm going to review with you. All right, so the new emerging drugs from, for headache, I probably should change it to emerged drugs because the first of these came out last May. So these are um, the three new 
antibodies that are injectable for migraine prevention. And um, of course, it's gotten a lot of attention um, on both traditional media and also on social media. Patients are really, um, it's sort of brought a lot of people out who haven't been cared for for migraine because they have, um, have these new treatments available, so they, they all, people want to try them. And these are the three. The first that came out was Arenumab on the top, and the brand name is Amavig. The second was, actually, they came out in order, it was really Fremonazumab on the bottom, which is Ajovi. And then the third is Galcanazumab, which is Mgality. So the, the names are not easy to digest, as, as often is the case with these monoclonal antibodies. So they all target, in some way, this, this peptide called CGRP, which is calcitonin gene-related peptide. So this peptide may be the most patent vasodilating neuropeptide in the body. Um, when the trigeminal ganglion or the superior sagittal sinus are stimulated in animal models, CGRP is, is released. Um, blood levels um, of this peptide are increased during migraine attacks and cluster headache attacks. And then that increase is blocked by sumatriptan, um, which is likely a sort of upstream inhibitor of CGRP release. Um, and then if you give CGRP an infusion of it to people who have migraine and cluster headache, it triggers those attacks in people who have that, those disorders. So it seems very specific for these primary headache disorders. And then also, sort of interictal levels seem to be high in people with chronic migraine, and then as they're treated, those levels diminish. So it seems like it's an important um, biomarker and also a causative biomarker. And these are sort of putting that into context with some treatments that we already have or some that may be available. Um, the triptans, which have been around for um, almost 30 years, they are serotonin 1B and 1D receptor agonists, and they prevent release of inflammatory neuropeptides like CGRP. Um, and then there's going to be a newer medicine called lasmitidan, which will likely come out sometime in 2020, um, which is a serotonin 1F agonist. So it only acts on neurons and not on blood vessels, unlike the triptans, which should open up an, a good population of patients who um, had cardiovascular disease that would not be prescribed triptans. And we'll talk about that. And then there's also CGRP targeting treatments, including these monoclonal antibodies that can target CGRP itself or its receptor, and those are out already. And then finally, there are these small molecule CGRP antagonists that have been studied for both acute and preventative treatment, and we'll review those too. The monoclonal antibodies came out first because earlier generation of the CGRP receptor antagonists were, were liver toxic. So that sort of led to their delay, and then the antibodies, which are not liver toxic, um, came to market first. So these are the, there's actually four CGRP targeting antibodies, the one on the left these are just in alphabetical order. The one on the left called eptinazumab um, is an intravenous version that hasn't come out yet, but that may be a good option for patients, especially those who might be referred in even such, an, such as an urgent care setting where um, they, you want to start a migraine preventative treatment immediately and it might have some efficacy even as early as day one of infusion. Um, and then the three antibodies that are already on the market. Um, Erenumab, which is um, in the second column there, is a CGRP receptor monoclonal antibody, and fremonazumab and galcanazumab are ligand or peptide monoclonal antibodies. They all seem to work similarly. I'll show you. They're all injectable that the patients can do themselves, or they can come in for nursing visits to have that done, as we often do for the first time. Um, arenumab and galcanazumab have this uh, pen, and fremonazumab is more of a conventional syringe and needle. And fremonazumab has a quarterly injection uh, frequency or a monthly one. The others are, are monthly. And galcanazumab, it was just a study published in the New England Journal, was also just approved for prevention of episodic cluster headache, too, which is exciting. And this is just a composite of all the clinical trials from phase three, which shows that every single drug studied for either episodic or chronic migraine all showed statistically significant benefits compared to placebo, every single one. So that's sort of a good proof of principle that, that this translational uh, neuroscientific discovery really works. What you will also notice, though, is that blue is the active treatment and orange is placebo, is that the order of magnitude is not so robust. I mean, you know, people who took placebo on average got, you know, one to three days of reduction of monthly migraine, and people who took active treatment um, got probably one to two more days of monthly migraine treatment. So it wasn't like a home run universally for all people. So this is certainly not a cure. And of course, in a clinical trial, this is sort of an averaging effect. There are some people who respond really well, and there's some people who don't respond at all, and they're all compiled together, and this is what you get. But the fact that it 
showed efficacy across every single study for every single um, spectrum of my migraine severity was sort of promising. Now, the big question about these treatments is not just do they work, but if they're safe. Um, mainly in the clinical trials, nothing serious was really uncovered. Although a few people died in the trials, because these are huge trials that, that were done over years with thousands of patients, none of them seem to be related to any of the study drug at all. So that's reassuring. Um, injection site reactions happen with all the drugs. Hypersensitivity reactions happen particularly with arenumab, but pretty uncommonly. And arenumab also can cause constipation, whereas the other drugs don't seem to. So that might be specific to the CGRP receptor targeting rather than the peptide targeting. And the big question in the long run is, um, since you, the CGRP is a potent vasodilator and it's released physiologically if someone has, say, a, 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 a myocardial infarction, CGRP is released to dilate surrounding coronary vasculature to prevent the infarct burden in the heart from being large. And the question is, if someone is on one of these inhibitors, if they have a heart attack, will it be more severe than it would have been otherwise? Or if they have a stroke, similar. Um, and no sort of increased incidence in cardiovascular events have been uncovered so far in these studies, which have extended out a few years of, you know, up, up to probably eight years, some patients have been on them already. Um, so, but it's still something that worries a lot of people because um, often these are migraine features, cardiovascular comorbidities. A lot of people we see in practice with migraine also have diabetes or hypertension or hyperlipidemia or are older and have acquired other vascular risk factors. And, um, and the question is always safety in this population. But so far, there's been no real signal seen, which is exciting. Um, this is sort of an editorial that we wrote in JAMA um, that sort of put a little bit of moderation on the enthusiasm for these medications just to give it better balance. And I think, you know, generally for migraine preventative treatments, um, the, the sort of holy grail has been 50% of patients get 50% better, and that was no different with these compared to, say, a beta blocker or topiramate or anything else. So um, I think that's just um, something to think about. And also, these, these are drugs with very long half-lives, and I'll show you there's a concern for, for people who are pregnant or breastfeeding, too. Now, where they really pay off, though, is in the tolerability. So this is... Um, this table that I borrowed from a study that, that looks at this ratio of number needed to treat over number needed to harm for migraine preventative treatments, um, which is a good marker of, of sort of tolerability and efficacy. And you can see um, they just studied arenumab, so the number needed to treat over number needed to harm, these ratios are in, you know, in the over 150 in here as well for chronic migraine, whereas for drugs like topiramate or even a beta blocker, that ratio is is really low. So this is just a quantification of how, basically how tolerable these drugs are compared to what, what we have already. So I guess a big question, of course, is who should use these? I mean, I think there's a lot of things that influence who gets these medications first. I don't know how you all are, if you get samples or not. We're not allowed to have them. But of course, if there are samples and everyone sort of gets them, and, and that's sort of a confounding variable. Um, and also can influence the perception of how the drugs work by probably enhances a placebo response. But um, really, the the general feeling is that these medicines should probably be used in people who um, are you know, severely disabled with migraine and can't take existing or can't tolerate existing treatments. And I think that's probably the best niche for these medicines for now until we prove that in the very long run, safety is really established. Um, and these are just other sort of... Um, um, points for where to avoid them. I'll talk about pregnancy in a moment. Um, generally, if someone has a very high risk of cardiovascular disease, if they have a known coronary artery disease or carotid disease, then I, generally I probably wouldn't use these as a first-line treatment at all, just because of the unknown safety in such a population. So the American Headache Society has a has a um, a position paper on this, which basically says what I what I mentioned. It should be really tried in adults who. Um, have migraine that could be episodic or chronic migraine and who have failed sort of exist or not tolerated existing treatments, which could be, you know, in the usual categories, topiramate, valproate, beta blocker, tricyclic, et cetera, SNRI. Um, or for chronic migraine, it could be botulinum toxin. So that's generally the, the official position paper on who should, who should try these medications. Now, we have three of them, so in clinical practice, it's hard to sort of choose which one we should prescribe, and there's no evidence or head-to-head -head studies at all for these medications. So often, we just use um, other sort of softer parameters for which medication we should choose. So I think there's 
lots of them, if a patient is constipated or on lots of constipating medications, then I often don't use arenumab and use the others because they don't cause constipation. Arenumab has, a late, has latex in the pen, so if someone has a latex allergy, I'll use one of the others. Um, if someone doesn't like um, needles, as is often the case, you might use um, the ones that have a pen, which is arenumab or galcanazumab rather than freminazumab, which it looks like a needle and a syringe, or you could use freminazumab and do it quarterly instead of every month. Um, and you know that's sort of the the sort of um, this is just an algorithm that I that I um, think. And I think there's also patients I have I have patients already who tried all three antibodies and have failed all three, or sometimes they fail one and try then then another one may work. So usually I alternate categories. If they fail a receptor antibody, I'll try a ligand antibody or vice versa, just because it seems to logically make sense that people could vary according to that type of a response. Another benefit of these treatments is that they seem to work much more quickly than, um, than the existing treatments that we have. So for example, propranolol um, or a behavioral treatment doesn't generally separate out until after sort of the second or third month from placebo. Um, botulinum toxin perhaps can separate out by a month or so. Um, and um, what you see on the top left is actually um, a, tri a trigeminal nerve stimulation device called cephaly, which um, you know, has been around now for a few years. And you don't see a separation from a sham device until really the second month. But these antibodies, and this is just one such study here, um, they separate out even as soon as day two. So I think um, this is one huge benefit is just that treatment latency is generally uh, much shorter in these drugs than for, for the older treatments. And this is just a big, ugly table that just shows that in randomized trials, people have been studied who failed other treatments because that's who's getting these medications first now in clinical practice. They fail topiramate or propranolol or botulinum toxin. And these people have been studied in the trials and seem to also benefit. And also, I don't know if anyone here is in, um, sees um, children or adolescents, but I think um, there's, they, they have not yet been studied or haven't had published studies for these antibodies. Um, so the sort of an expert consensus from pediatric headache specialists has come out um, to suggest that, yes, it's reasonable to try these antibodies in teenagers um, um, if they have frequent migraine and have failed two or more preventative treatments, just like similar to adults. Um, and um, I think, you know, in the absence of clinical trials for this population, this type of expert opinion, I think, is important. Um, for pregnant women, I think the big concern, these drugs have long half-lives, a month or more. So often, um, you know, migraine features, it's prime disability in women who are of childbearing age. So this conversation comes up all the time. So CGRP seems to be important, actually, in placental health and may actually be protective against the development of preeclampsia. And actually, migraine is a risk factor for preeclampsia. Um, so it, it seems sort of worrisome to, to have someone take a medication like this um, in, in pregnancy. So generally, um, I think most people really suggest um, not using it for at least five to six months before someone is trying to conceive. So that does take a lot of people out of consideration for using the, these treatments. So that's, that's important to know. There hasn't been any adverse events proven in animal studies of, of using these antibodies in um, pregnant animals. But um, that doesn't mean that in humans that won't elevate the risk of preeclampsia, for example. Um, so for acute treatments now, I think um, you know we use NSAIDs and triptans, but um, especially triptans, which have these cardiovascular comorbidities, or they just don't work for everyone, um, what do we use? And there's lots of other options, but no one is very excited about a lot of the other options. I mean, I just put sort of a list of things that are commonly tried um, and why sometimes um, it is more challenging to use them. I think, um, you know, for example, lidocaine nasal spray sometimes can help. There's some evidence that it works, and it's even safe in pregnant women because lidocaine is generally a safe medicine, but it has to come from a compounding pharmacy, and it's, it's not cheap to, to get it. Generally, insurances don't necessarily reimburse for it. And there's all sorts of things that have been tried. There's, there was a study that got a lot of press about Timolol eye drops for migraine, even though it was really a negative study. But um, um, so there's, there's sort of this real need for um, other um, acute treatments for migraine. So the GPANs, these CGRP um, small molecule antagonists, may help fill that need. And there's um, 
there's four of them that are being studied right now, including um, two of them, two on the left, that have been studied for acute treatment, including one that was just published in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago that got a lot of attention. So that, that was remegipant. So these seem to have pain-free rates that are similar to what you would see in, from a triptan in a clinical trial and seem to be pretty well tolerated and, um, and don't seem to really cause too many significant adverse effects, which triptans okay, often do. And then lasmitidan is this, as I mentioned earlier, this, it works like a triptan, but it specifically works on serotonin receptors that are just on neurons. And also seems to have good efficacy rates that are comparable to, to say, triptans. Um, but if you look at the side effects, what you can see is that like sort of central nervous system side effects are what have been seen. So dizziness, fatigue, people feel lethargic. And it's probably because this drug penetrates the blood-brain barrier. And because of that, um, there's been a lot of things looked into about it, including di how dizziness really seems dose-related and, um, and um, is transient as a side effect. But the question for me is, I don't know, I see a ton of people also with vertigo, and I'm sure many, any of you who do any headache or general neurologic practice do too, and vestibular migraine has become a very common diagnosis to make, so it, it makes you wonder if this should be avoided for people like that. And then the FDA, because of this dizziness and somnolent side effect, actually made um, the company do a study about driving performance. Um, um, because of somnolence. And, um, and it looks like driving performance, when it's been studied objectively, um, is actually impaired by this medication after about two hours, and it resolves by eight hours. Um, so I think um, that is something that might really limit sort of who um, would be, wh who sort of who can take this medication. I think that's an important, um, um, it's going to be a, probably a black box warning, is my guess, by the FDA. And because people who will be prescribed this will be people who can't take triptan, so it's going to basically be probably older patients who might be more susceptible to dizziness and somnolence. So I think um, the niche for this medication, I think, to me, is still somewhat unclear. All right, next are sort of devices. Um, and there are lots of places where devices can target in, in, in headache treatment. So on the left are the peripheral nervous system targets, and on the right are central nervous system targets. And there's now, as I'll show you, four devices that have been cleared by the FDA for headache treatment, which is exciting. Um, and you know, you can target places that are very accessible in the peripheral nervous system, or even places that are very deep. For example, you know, neurosurgeons can do implanted deep brain stimulation in the hypothalamus for people who have intractable chronic cluster headache, and there's some evidence for that. But in routine practice, um, some of the targets you see here, um, and this is just another way of showing it, um, and I'll show you, actually, I'll just skip to this. This is the, this is the sort of the four devices that have been cleared by the FDA. So the first, which I showed you some of the data for already, was this, that Cephaly device, the tri trigeminal nerve stimulation device, where it's actually approved for both preventative treatment, it's worn for 20 minutes a day, um, and also as an acute treatment for migraine. Um, on the bottom left is this device called the Spring TMS device. It's a handheld transcranial magnetic stimulation device that delivers a single pulse of magnetic stimulation to the occiput. And, in, and it seems to arrest cortical spreading depression, which is the physiological equivalent of migraine aura. Um, that has been cleared by the FDA and actually is the only preventative treatment that's cleared by the FDA um, for these devices that starts out at age 13. Um, and then on the top right, you see this device called the Gamma Core device, which is a handheld vagus nerve stimulation device that now has been approved for both the acute treatment of migraine and cluster headache, and also as a preventative treatment for cluster headache as an add-on to other medicines. And that seems to be well tolerated. And then the last one, which um, hasn't been commercialized yet, but has been approved by the FDA, is this device that's been branded as this Nerivio Migra device. So it's it's kind of interesting. It's just a, you, it's an armband that you wear, and it stimulates cutaneous sensory nerve branches, and then you activate it with an app on your phone. And it's an acute. It, it generally works best as an acute treatment for someone who has episodic migraine when the pain hasn't become severe yet, and um, seems to um, seems to work well um, for that particular type of population. Um, this is just some of the studies for the the trigeminal nerve stimulation device. Um, and it shows that um, it seems to work okay as a preventative treatment, but the, you know, the outcomes are not totally robust in terms of reducing migraine frequency by this huge number. Or for acute treatment for pain intensity, it's diminished 
though I think um, it takes an hour to, to treat it. It's hard for someone to sort of sit there with this device for an hour in my own clinical practice. Then the, the TMS device, where you hold to the back of the head, um, also is a little bit cumbersome to use in my view. It works for acute treatment. Um, it's easier to use in that way for preventative treatment to give yourself um, um, three sessions of, uh, you know, or four pulses twice a day is sort of also a cumbersome administration, but it, it seems to be quite safe um, and um, has evidence also, at least for safety in adolescence. And then this um, gamma core device, you can see there's just been so many randomized trials for it, um, so I think they probably have the most investment in it. And um, you know, some of the studies don't show outcomes that are sort of even have p-values that are less than 0 0.5. 0.05, and the reason for that is that um, the FDA will clear devices mainly for safety, not necessarily for efficacy. So I think this device has gotten cleared for many different indications, but the evidence for it to be effective is not generally so so great. And there's still a chronic migraine preventative study for this. I think the big limitation for all these devices is, is how expensive they all are. And I think at least this device lately has some program just like the monoclonal antibodies do, where you can get a year free if you have commercial insurance, and then they work on the back end for prior authorization. Um, so that, that's good, but it also leaves the people who have government-based insurance sort of um, empty-handed. And then these, this is the device that I showed you before, the, the armband device. Um, there was two clinical trials. The most recent was published um, a few months ago in Headache, and that's basically the construct where there's, there's an app on your phone and you activate it and um, it gives two hour pain free rates that are similar to what I showed you in other studies. And then there's also one that may come out at some point, this vestibular stimulation. Um, so you wear this headphones and it stimulates your vestibular system using temperature change as a way to modulate the trigeminal system through vestibular afferents. And um, this also seems to help as a preventative treatment although dizziness was a side effect. And of course, people who have maybe vestibular migraine, you would think to use this treatment for them in particular, but um, we'll have to see what, what the next study shows. All right, and just a few updates on procedures. I think, um, you know, I know, for example, I know Dr. Wei does all these procedures, but some of you um, may do this or be exposed to it. You know, certainly botulinum toxin is very mainstream treatment. It's the only FDA approved treatment specifically for chronic migraine. And the reason is because it didn't show efficacy for people of migraine that's less frequent. Um, but it seems to work very well for chronic migraine and it's a preventative treatment. Um, peripheral nerve blocks, which are most commonly given as occipital nerve blocks, um, also I'll show you have lots of evidence now. And although it's a frequent source of rejection of prior authorizations and insurance claims, um, it's really sort of um, disingenuous because the evidence for it and safety for it is really quite strong now. And those are used for cluster headache and migraine. And then trigger point injections are generally have the best evidence for tension type headache, but often we use them as an adjunctive treatment for nerve blocks. And um, sphenopalatine ganglion blocks have sort of had a renaissance laid because of these catheters that were um, invented um, that sort of administer the, the, an anesthetic in a sort of less um, gruesome way. I'll show you what those are like in a second. Those have been studied the most for migraine and chronic migraine specifically. So botulinum toxin, um, you know, some of you may know this already. This is just the injection paradigm. It's it's not really designed to be tailored to the site of the pain. It's really this collective um, um, injection paradigm that works on peripheral sensory afferents in the trigeminal and upper cervical system. And the theory is that it, you know, first it just reduces peripheral release uh, and peripheral sensitization, so it reduces release of peptides like CGRP and others, and then that sort of has a secondary effect on the central nervous system. And there's more direct effects than we probably realize because, for example, here, um, the same afferent that goes to the dura, which is on number two, may cross um, skull suture lines and also supply um, extracranial structures in the scalp, which is the direct target of botulinum toxin. So it could be when you do botulinum toxin injections, you're actually targeting um, peripheral afferents that also share similar neuronal origins for, as, the, as inside the skull in the dura. And the other way can also happen where um, afferents that have their first path extracranially can cross suture lines and supply the dura um, secondarily. And you know, these botulinum toxins were approved for chronic migraine in 2010. Um, and of course, what's sort of infamous about their trials is that the placebo response also is extremely high. Um, so giving 
you know, normal saline injections every three months also works to treat chronic migraine, but I think, um, and that sort of gives a lot of thought to how other treatments like acupuncture might work for migraine because that's just a needle without any injection, but luckily that's some form of neuromodulation too. And then there's recent long-term studies looking at um, how botulinum toxin may work for, for even two plus years after starting it, and it seems to show that benefits continue to be somewhat incremental over time. These are these studies on the right. Because often it's a treatment that we start, but there's really no sort of path to stop it and when to stop it. And I think, um, I'm sure the pharmaceutical companies are happy for you to never stop it. And this just shows that benefits might be incremental for at least um, two years. So I think, um, um, I think it's good to stop it if it's working and people are doing extremely well. But how to do it is sort of challenging because you can only lower the dose so much and you can only lower the dosing frequency so much because theoretically it might wear off. And if you space out the injections for, say, four months or five months, <coughs> excuse me, um, they might get worse again for that window where the medicine wears off. Um, and there's been smaller studies studying botulinum toxin against other treatments that show similar, similar efficacy, but it's just tolerated better. And then just a quick review of what's the most common probably side effect nowadays, which is, which is this, which is medial brow ptosis, which, um, which is not so uncommon. It look, usually looks more symmetric. You know, people call it the Spock eyes because from Spock from Star Trek has that V-looking forehead appearance, and that's what, um, that's what probably many of us have done to patients. Um, but it's just a known um, adverse effect, and there's ways to sort of minimize that cosmetically. And um, it used to be that neck pain was a more common side effect, but in the revised protocol that was published, the, the cervical paraspinal injections are now much more higher, much more superior, and closer to the occiput. So that has really eliminated um, neck extensor weakness as a, as a sort of consequence of, of this treatment for migraine. Um, the next procedures, there's, we have a bunch of consensus statements for sort of how to do them from the American Headache Society, from our procedure group. Um, I'll show you. Um, these are peripheral nerve blocks, so of course in clinical practice, um, occipital nerve blocks, which you see on the left, greater towards the middle and lesser um, more laterally. Those are what's most commonly done, but you can also do auriculotemporal nerve blocks here and then also supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve blocks. Occipital nerve blocks have the best um, evidence, whereas the other nerve blocks don't have very much evidence at all. Um, but the evidence has become really robust, so whenever insurance companies um, reject your claims for doing these procedures for patients, it really seems unfair. Um, now there's um, four out of five randomized trials show that it worked as a short-term preventative treatment for migraine. This is occipital nerve blocks. Um, and then for acute treatment, there's actually been now two studies in emergency departments. I was a part of one of them um, that show that for acute migraine, um, it generally works. Um, and that's a very um, useful treatment in that setting for someone, say, who might have status migranosis and sees you in the office. Um, for cluster headache, there's two randomized trials that show that an occipital nerve injection with a steroid um, works as a cluster headache short-term preventative treatment and has level A evidence for in an American Headache Society guideline. And then there's also um, studies that um, look at using these treatments in special populations who might not be eligible for other treatments like um, adolescents or pregnant women or older patients. Um, and I think those are useful too. Trigger point injections. Um, I probably use the least of those, but still, um, I still use them pretty, uh, you know, at some moderate frequency, often with nerve blocks. But it's sometimes you do see people who have truly just a myofascial pain syndrome, and, and a trigger point injection can really go a long way. Um, the most common injections that are done are in the trapezius on the left, the sternocleidomastoid um, in the middle, and then the temporalis muscle on the right. These are generally done with local anesthetics and not steroids, and steroids can be myotoxic even locally. Um, the sphenopalatine ganglion blocks, what you see on the right is sort of the traditional way to do it. And this is sort of the more gruesome way that I was alluding to where you um, have a you know, long cotton swab and you put it deep into the nasopharynx and have the patient lie supine and then the anesthetic should drip down through the pterygopalatine foramen and into the SPG. Um, so that's what you see on the right. And then there are these newer catheters that you see on the left that have been developed, although one of the companies seem to have gone out of business. Yeah. Do you ever use steroids anteriorly? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I, for migraine, the evidence for adding a steroid to the anesthetics for occipital nerve injections is not really there. It hasn't shown improved outcomes. So when I, if I, But I will do it sometimes, and I'll do it if, say, a, a nerve block with anesthetic alone didn't last long enough and you want to do it again. Um, doing steroids in the other blocks, um, I, I, I've done it on occasion if someone I think really has, like, say, a supraorbital neuralgia if they have, say, they've had head trauma. But in general, it's much more risky cosmetically. You can get a, a sort of area of um, muscle or fat atrophy, and they can have a cosmetic outcome that isn't terribly favorable. I, I, I generally don't use steroids anteriorly, but I sometimes use them in the gut. I'm the same way, okay. yep. And for cluster headache, I always use a steroid because that's what the evidence shows and not, not a local anesthetic. Okay. And this is... Well, question about SPDs. Sure. You know, online, they talk about teaching patients to do this themselves. Yeah. No, I'm too scared to do that because if they have some sinus or skull based defect and they ram a Q tip up their cribiform plate, that would be pretty ugly. And I think there's a few cases of that happening. Um, sorry, I'm going backwards. The other thing about SPG blocks that has given me some concern is that there's these recent anatomical studies that show that the, the pterygopalatine foramen distance is actually longer than what people have appreciated. And also, the foramen might actually be a closed foramen, which could mean that you know we could we maybe it's better to send people like this to our interventional radiology friends for the percutaneous blocks which um which in my sort of experience has been a bit more effective although it's just a more aggressive treatment um, but it seems to also be safe um, rather than doing doing it one of the catheters is not available anymore the company seems to have folded but um, the one that's still um, is being marketed is this tx360 device which is this one which um, has a different route than these others, which get to above the turbinates. This one goes below the turbinates and then is angled laterally and um, posteriorly and seems to be more an accurate way to get to the foramen. I don't, I don't know if anyone here has experience with that catheter device. Um, it's also a big issue with coding and billing because insurance companies don't think that an SPG block is really a block if you're doing an intranasal route because it's not a... It's not a um, it's not a puncture of anything. So there's like also this um, um, limitation with with um, billing and coding for doing these, which has become a problem in like in, uh, nationally, really, um, which also makes our interventional radiology friends happier because theirs is always covered, of course, even though the evidence for it is so is so little. Um, and this is just studies that show about um, doing them in special populations, nerve blocks in particular, which I think are very useful. Um, and then this is just, we've done a study about why we should train junior neurologists and trainees in doing these nerve blocks. And I think um, it's important that people who enter general neurologic practice are equipped with using these, these treatments because they can really help. And also neurology needs more procedures under our belt because they're too often stolen away by pain medicine or neurosurgeons or physiatrists. And I think neurology needs to take more ownership over pain, pain proce over procedures that are really, really in our, um, in our lane. So just to sort of summarize, um, certainly the, the need for new therapies, um, I think I hope to make pretty clear. You also need, you know, we need migraine treatments for people with migraine that are designer drugs and they'll generally work better and be better tolerated. Um, these new treatments that are based against CGRP seem to have good biological rationale. They're pretty convenient and they seem to be consistently effective and work in the short term. Uh, and, and also be safe in the short term, and the long term is still to be determined. And these neuromodulation devices um, seem to be also quite safe and versatile, and some of them are effective. And of course, a lot of the big questions are about cost and access of all these treatments because they're super expensive treatments, and it often takes time for um, them to really be accepted by insurance companies and other um, organizations, and of course, long-term safety of all these two. And that is it. So thank you very much. Any questions about anything? Yes. Uh, so in your experience for patients who have done well with uh, sipital nerve blocks, but they don't like to come in so frequently to get them, what's been your experience with doing um, you know, referrals to uh, pain management for ablation of the nerve or sipital nerve stimulators? Yeah, I mean, the occipital nerve stimulators, I didn't review that, but the, the, the data on that was, was hard because they, they just, occipital nerve stimulators were designed really to be spinal cord stimulators that are then placed higher up and they didn't stay well and the leads would move and um, 
and I think um, the studies didn't show any great outcomes either. So I generally don't do that much anymore, but um, the evidence for doing the other treatments like radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation of the occipital nerve is not um, really there at all, but it, it makes sense to do it in people with that particular niche who respond to blocks and, um, and, um, and are sort of can't take or you don't want to use other treatments. Although it, it was looked at for doing occipital nerve blocks as a predictor for who would respond to occipital nerve stimulation and it didn't predict uh, if you responded to a block, it didn't predict responding to a neurostimulator in the same place. So that also adds a little wrinkle. Yeah. I don't think we see anything terribly bad at the moment. No, I think, um, I mean, if you go, there's, there's a, FDA, a reporting site in the FDA that's publicly searchable. So anyone who reports an adverse event can, can report something, whether it's a patient or a physician or, or um, any other clinician. And there's all sorts of noise on that site. But really, in, there hasn't seemed to be any real big safety signal for these. I think um, and there's even a question of could they, induce something like reversible cerebral vasoconstrictive syndrome. Um, um, but that, I don't think there's really been any cases reported of that. So, so I mean, so far, so good with the safety, but. Um, yeah. And they've been used, in, um, you know, thousands of people have had this over the last year. Right? Yeah, yeah, probably hundreds of thousands. I mean, probably close to a million people, I would think, um, almost by now. It's pretty remarkable. And they're also being used, you know, another place where they're used off-label is for post-traumatic headaches, so someone who has a chronic post-traumatic headache that may resemble chronic migraine. Um, I use it in patients like that because we treat those people as if they have chronic, according to their headache phenotype. So if they have post-traumatic headache that resembles chronic migraine, we use migraine medicines for them anyway. I've used Botox for chronic Yep, absolutely. Post-traumatic chronic migraine. Same. Yeah. Just a question about rebound headaches if someone presents there. Not, that's a great question. So the question is this, this phenomenon of rebound headache or medication overuse um, that complicates migraine and how to manage it. I think um, there's, a re there's a clinical trial that's looking at that approach actually right now. Sort of should someone just be detoxified or be detoxified plus a preventative medicine um, at the same time. One study has been done for that and it showed that there was no difference. So it seemed... Um, or no difference in harm, and people who are on a preventative treatment might have gotten better more quickly. So I think it seems better to um, put someone on a preventative treatment at the same time as instructing them about detoxifying them from their as-needed medication. That's that's my general approach. Um, but it's it's not a, that not everyone does that. But um, but I think um, it seems in clinical trials, say for the CGRP treatments, there was a paper published in Neurology a few months ago looking at outcomes in people with migraine plus medication overuse versus those who have, uh, who don't have medication overuse, and it worked just as well in both populations. So that, that helps to add credibility to putting someone on a preventative treatment, whether it's a CGRP targeting treatment or botulinum toxin or um, anything else. Yeah. So there's a non-headache, uh, on-call kind of uh, question. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah, that's it's that's a whole. I mean, that's such a common phone call, and there's just no evidence for that sort of situation. So I, I mean, I often, and I mean, when Dr. Wei was our fellow in the headache center at Montefiore, that was like eighty percent or ninety percent of the phone calls that she would triage, which were like many, um, and um, um, you know, often a course of steroid. Um, maybe a course of a triptan that has a longer half-life for in a standing um, way for four to five days, like narotriptan or forovertriptan. Um, DHE comes in a nasal spray, 
which is branded as migranol, so that can be useful. Um, similar to what you might do if someone was in the hospital and needed IV DHG. Um, and nerve blocks, of course, if you're not there, you can't do them, but those would also be another treatment. Um, but it's, but that phone call is common, and managing it is not always so straightforward. But I still probably use dexamethasone, a short course of it is probably the most common um, uh, treatment to break someone out of status migranosis. I haven't had someone who had a avascular necrosis of the hip as an idiosyncratic side effect. Yet, in theory, it's, it's a, it could happen even in just a short burst of steroids like that, but... Um, Are you uh, oral or IV? Well, oral, I think, if they're home, yeah. What do Yeah, I mean, sometimes you could give, a, if you wanted to just do a one-time dose of 10 milligrams, but more often I will just do a tapering course of you know, four or three times a day for a day, then twice a day for the second day, and once on the third day. And why dex rather than prednisone? You could do prednisone too. I think um, maybe dex, based on our neurooncology um, um, experience, might be better for central nervous system inflammation. Um, also, dex is the steroid that has shown evidence in emergency department based uh, migraine studies where giving a 10 milligram dose reduces headache outcome 72 hours later, so probably a combination of those reasons. But for example, for cluster headache, I always use prednisone, um, and I don't know why, but maybe I should use dexamethasone, or I don't know. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you for having me.